Hello everyone and welcome to lecture three on membrane potentials. Uh, in the picture above the title, I actually put an image of an EEG. Uh, and the reason for this and, and how it's related to what we're going to discuss today uh, is not because we're going to be reviewing EEGs, but uh, to show you that membrane potentials are related to sort of electrical properties of cells. And we can see these electrical properties and we use them actually clinically to make diagnoses. So for example, an EEG, we could use to diagnose, you know, if there was a seizure, it can help us figure out what type of seizure it is or even localize the seizure. So it can be very useful for that. Uh, in addition, if you look closely at the very bottom of the EEG, you can see, and I'll circle it here in red for you, you can see uh, a part of it that's labeled as an EKG. So an electrocardiogram. So this is also looking at electrical activity of the heart, and you can actually take a look at the waveforms of the heart there that look different from what you see uh, in the brain. And keep in mind, this is uh, electrical activity from collections of cells uh, acting together. So it's a collective electrical response. Today, we're going to learn about how an individual cell can carry out an electrical response, like a neuron, for example. Uh, and also how, you know, other parts of, or other cells in your body can also uh, use membrane potentials to carry out some of their normal function. And the picture of the little girl over there is actually my daughter. She was about eight or nine months old at the time. And she was hooked up with electrodes. And you can see the, uh, it's covered right there with that bandage over her head. And, um, they had thought that she had maybe had some type of seizure type episode and so they kept her on the EEG overnight to see if there was any kind of activity. Thankfully there was not. Okay, so membrane potential. All right, this is the difference in electrical charge between two sides of the membrane. So if you take a look at my very simple drawing right here, okay, this is that circle there represents the cell and uh, you know everything outside around it would represent the outside of the cell okay but you can see inside the cell something i want to quickly point out that i have mentioned in previous lectures okay is sodium for example has a concentration of approximately about 14 millimoles per liter okay outside of the cell over here in the extracellular fluid is 140 millimoles and I've talked about this before but just to remind you that sodium is in higher concentration in the extracellular fluid okay so there's a gradient between the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell if you recall molecules want to move down their concentration gradient so in this case sodium would want to move into the cell down its concentration gradient now a normal cell will also have a higher concentration of potassium inside the cell relative to the outside of the cell. So here we have a concentration gradient that's very similar to what sodium's is. However, potassium in this case, according to its concentration gradient, wants to move out of the cell. All right, so sodium wants to move in, potassium wants to move out, but both, in both cases, they're moving down their concentration gradients. All right, now under normal circumstances, our cells physiologically are able to maintain this concentration gradient and we'll get into that more as we go along all right but the other thing I want to point out is that we also have a charge inside many of our cells in our body all right a voltage and in fact the voltage are very small so we usually call them millivolts and so you can see here inside this particular cartoon cell that I've drawn for you is about negative 70 millivolts and that is actually a an average uh, potential inside most neurons okay now it's negative 70 relative to the extracellular fluid which is really uh, our baseline and that's always going to be about zero millivolts so we compare it to the extracellular space which is zero millivolts so all the positives and negative charges kind of cancel each other out in the extracellular space there and so the inside of the cell relative to the outside of the cell is negative all right it has a, an overall negative charge negative 70 millivolts and we'll talk about why that is in, in more detail okay so we have an uneven diffusion of ions across the membrane that will actually produce this membrane potential that you saw so when I drew out that cell from before all right I'll just draw again a little circle over here this is the cell and I said it was about negative 70 millivolts okay so that negative 70 millivolts 
is brought about by concentration differences, all right, uh, uh, what we call an electrochemical gradient, all right, and permeability differences. How easily does that ion cross the membrane? How easily can it get out of the cell or into the cell? So permeability plays a, a very large role here, okay? So what, what I have in this little box down here is I've separated out the permeability for um, each of the ions, all right? And you can see here, for example, sodium. If I set uh, its permeability relative to one, so whatever sodium's permeability is, let's just set it to one. We're gonna normalize it to one, okay? And potassium relative to sodium's permeability is 100, which means it's 100 times more permeable than sodium. That's how to interpret that, all right? Chloride, all right, for example, has a wider range, anywhere from 10 times more permeable to sodium up to 1,000 times more permeable than sodium. So again, that's going to depend on what you know, type of cells we're talking about and what have you. So there's a, there can be a lot of variability, all right? The, the last one, which is the A minus, that just uh, a denotion for uh, anions, which are, um, you know, in abundance inside the intracellular fluid, which you can see over here. The intracellular fluid, 190 milli equivalents, uh, compared to you know one milli equivalent in the extracellular fluid, and so its relative permeability is really about zero or, or close to zero. So a lot of the anions that help to contribute to that negative potential inside the cells. They're sort of fixed there. They don't get out of the cell, or they're not permeable. All right, so that helps to contribute to that. Now, um, in terms of its permeability, what what dictates one ion's permeability uh, being, you know, an increase in permeability over another ion's permeability? Uh, it really depends on the number of channels, for example, that they have. So, potassium having 100 times the permeability of sodium may mean that it has uh, many more uh, channels. Uh, it may also depend on, you know, relatively how long they spend open versus closed. All right, so there may be, let's say, 50 more channels than there are sodium, but they spend, you know, three times as long open than sodium as well. So it, it depends on how long they stay open to allow ions to actually move and diffuse down their gradients, or how many, you know, actual channels there are. Right, the more you have. The more of them that become open, the more you know, the more permeable that ion is going to be. It's going to be able to move more readily down its concentration gradient. Okay. Okay. So the ion channels. All right. So just to reiterate, um, the ions are charged atoms. Right. So we're talking about things like sodium, which in the body in solution they would be positively charged. Potassium is positively charged. Chloride is negatively charged. So these charges will make a difference because we're talking about an electrochemical gradient. So not only do we have to take into account the concentration gradient, which will have its, its own force, right? Uh, in, for instance, the larger the gradient, the more force we could generate or the more, you know, the more energy it's going to have to get down its gradient. But then there's the electrical gradient. So we're going to be comparing charges now and how you know that positive charges repel positive charges and negatives repel negative, right? But then positives and negatives attract. And so that plays a role in influencing concentration gradients. So this is why we, you know, when we talk about ions, they're gonna have a special electrochemical gradient to them. We have to take into those two factors. In terms of the channels now, in terms of their permeability, allowing them to get in or out of the cell, remember that ions can't readily cross plasma membranes. They can't simply diffuse through a plasma membrane. They have selective permeability or they have selective diffusion or restricted diffusion. This means that they have to go down their concentration gradient through specialized channels. Now those channels could be constitutively open, meaning they're always open and it allows them to kind of free flow. On the other hand, uh, there are many channels, ion channels, that are gated, okay? Meaning, you know, they'll open and close depending on the conditions. So one of those conditions means there's a, a, a ligand present. So in the ligand gated channels, uh, it'll be open or closed, all right? Open or closed by hormones, second messengers uh, or neurotransmitters, for example. So it could bind to a specific pocket on that channel, causes the gate to open, for example. So if we have, say, acetylcholine that's released from a neuron, binds to a receptor on another neuron, that opens up the channel and allows certain ions to pass through, okay? Now, there's also voltage-gated, 
Voltage gates don't respond to ligands because they have no binding sites for the ligands. Instead, what they do is they respond by opening or closing in response to changes in the membrane uh, potential. So for example, I'll draw it kind of smaller over here, but to emphasize the point for voltage gated, if I have a cell that is say, this is my cell, and it's at negative 70, which I told you is you know, resting membrane potential for most neurons, for example, it's at negative 70, these voltage gated channels may be closed at that voltage. Now, based on things I'll talk about in a little bit, let's say the voltage does change though. So we go from negative 70, and I'm gonna draw the cell again over here, but now let's say we hit negative 40. All right, so the voltage went from negative 70 to negative 40. When it goes to negative 40, these voltage gated may uh, respond to that, to that voltage and open. So they respond to the change in voltage. So we call that a threshold. So it reached the threshold with which the voltage gated channels will open. And there's a whole host of different voltage gated channels like potassium and, and sodium and ones that we're going to be talking about a lot today. And so that's how they respond as opposed to a ligand response. And so they'll have very characteristic opening and closing patterns, which we'll get into. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is I want to just show you how an ion or how the movement of ions can change the membrane or can change the potential of a cell. So let's say this box I've divided in half with a semi-permeable membrane. We'll call this cell A, we'll call this one B. All right, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw some sodium chloride. Let's say I put sodium chloride. All right, so again, sodium is positively charged, chloride is negatively charged. Okay, and let's say in cell B there is, all right, in this box here, there's a tiny mint amount of sodium. I'm just going to draw it as a small Na and a small chloride to just visually so we can see that there's a concentration difference. So the small Na and the small Cl represent a lower concentration. All right. So now the question is, all right, which one's permeable across the membrane? So let's say, for instance, that sodium can move across that membrane, but chloride cannot. So let me draw an arrow. So remember, it's going to go down its concentration gradient. So if you look, it's going to go from A to B, down its concentration gradient, since there's a higher concentration of sodium inside box A than there is in box B. Now chloride would also want to go down its concentration gradient. However, in this uh, example, it is impermeable. All right, so what happens is it just gets turned away because there's no, no permeability for chloride. So even though it wants to go down its concentration gradient, it will not be able to. Now as sodium goes down its concentration gradient, all right, the next thing I want to ask is about what happens to the charge in A versus B. So what I mean is this, as sodium, as these positive ions start moving into B, both A and B were neutral to start, but as sodium moves into B down its concentration gradient, what happens to the charge inside B? Well, inside B starts to become more and more positive. You know what, let me use the same color here as the arrow. So it becomes more and more positive. So we start to accumulate more positive charges in B simply because sodium is moving into it. Right? We have an imbalance now. We have more positive charges than there are negative charges. So it becomes more positive overall. So we could have a positive potential there. And the counter to that is what's actually happening in A. As positive charges are leaving, we also have an imbalance there. We're left with more negative charges than positive. And so you guessed it, right? Inside A becomes more and more negative. And so this was brought about because one, we had a concentration gradient. And two, we had a difference in permeability between two ions. Right? They both initially started out being neutral as the number of positive charges and negative charges equaled one another. But since the membrane was only permeable to sodium, it did not allow chloride to move at all. If it had, 
then we would have had equal amounts of charges moving together and there would be no difference in the charge on either side. Because any positive ion that moves, so would a negative ion. All right, because chloride would have gone down its concentration gradient to the same extent. But instead, it's only permeable to sodium, which means now I have a difference in charge. Positive ion is moving across to B, making it more positive, and leaving A, making it more overall more net negative. So this is the same general idea that's actually occurring inside our cells to make it more negative. All right, so let me just do another example with this. I'm going to erase this. And you'll see how the charges will change on either side if I just change the permeability of the particular ion. So for example, let's say chloride is now permeable through that membrane, but sodium is not. So chloride goes down its gradient towards B, and instead now negative charges start to accumulate inside B, leaving behind net positive charge on the side. Okay? So that's what it would look like if it were chloride moving, all right? Same concept. Now, the next part of this I want, to, I want to mention is this. Let's say I have chloride moving down its concentration gradient. All right, as it moves down and we start to accumulate more and more negative charges on side B, all right, because now this box is becoming more and more negative and chloride is a negative uh, ion. In other words, it's an anion, right? So as it's moving there and it becomes more and more negative, what's going to happen is as the charge becomes more and more negative, that overall negative charge accumulation in box B will actually start to repel the movement of the negative chloride ion. So initially, it was moving via its concentration gradient, the force of that concentration gradient as it moves down and into side B. But as side B becomes more and more negatively charged, that's accumulation of negative charge will start to repel the movement of chloride going down its concentration gradient because it's repelling these negative ions back. This is the nature of an electrochemical gradient. Okay, is the fact that even though there may still be a concentration gradient, chloride may no longer be able to move down its concentration gradient simply because it's being repelled by the accumulation of negative charge on the opposite side. So we may never reach an equilibrium in terms of concentration of chloride on the side A versus side B because it's being repelled by that negative charge is now accumulating. The same would go for sodium if I would to, to give you the same example with sodium. It's the same thing. Sodium would go down its concentration gradient until enough po positive charges accumulated to repel its movement down its gradient. Now the flip side is true, even though chloride is also being repelled by the negative charges accumulating inside B, it's also being more attracted by the accumulation of positive charges on side A. Remember the opposites will attract as well. So the combination of being attracted to the, the, the higher positive charge in A and being repelled by the negative charges in B overall is going to reduce chloride from being able to go down its concentration gradient any further and it will ultimately reach an equilibrium. The question is, what is that equilibrium? At what point will chloride stop going down its concentration gradient all right, in, uh, and be repelled by that negative charge? All right, how negative or how negative does that charge have to become? What is the millivolts that it would have to reach in order to keep chloride from going down its concentration gradient any further? Well, it depends. How big is the concentration gradient? The bigger the gradient between the two sides, right, the more force, more driving force chloride is going to have to want to really get in this side. So for example, if I have, like I say, 10 millimoles uh, per liter, 10 millimoles per liter of chloride on this side, and I only have one millimole per liter on that side, my gradient is, is 10, right? So it's 10 to one. Well, there's going to be a certain amount of voltage it's going to take in order to keep chloride from going any further down its concentration gradient. But if, let's say, I take that 10, and instead of making it 10, I make it 50, 50 millimoles per liter, and I still keep it at 1 on side B, there's still a gradient, 
but it's a much bigger gradient. So there's a much greater driving force for chloride to want to move from side A to side B, right? Because it's clustered with more of these chloride molecules in side A, so it really wants to move down its gradient with even greater force, which means that the voltage in side B is going to have to become even more negative in order to repel that force. And so how negative does it have to become at that concentration to now stop it from going down that gradient? It seems like it's an impossible question to answer, but if you guys know or remember your, your, your neuroscience, you may remember something called the Nernst potential. And that's what that's about. It says, well, what is the concentration gradient? So we know how much the driving force is there. And we can actually calculate the amount of negative charge or the potential inside the cell it would take to keep an ion from moving down its concentration gradient. What would the potential have to be? So we can actually calculate that specifically for any single given ion. Okay, so let's try quickly just a quick physiologic example. So I'm going to erase what I've drawn here so far. And I'm going to call it different. Instead of A and B, I'm going to say this is the extracellular fluid or the extracellular space. And this is inside the cell over here. So we'll call it the intracellular fluid. But so uh, the ICF is really my cell over here. And I'm going to draw inside it potassium. Since we know potassium is at higher concentration inside the cell. And let's just say that that concentration is 150 millimoles, which is pretty close to physiologic. All right. Now the counter ions here would be the anions. I'm just going to put A minus as the anions. And so that would be things like phosphates and proteins, things that cannot get out of the cell. So it maintains uh, you know, those negative ions inside the cell. They can't get out. They're not permeable. So let's see what happens here. I have a very low, again, I have potassium out here. I'm going to draw a little smaller, but it's 4 millimoles per liter. Okay. Now let's see what happens here. The core first question is where does potassium want to go in terms of its concentration gradient and that would be outside of the cell and we're going to assume for now potassium is permeable and the anions are impermeable so potassium wants out of the cell and this is normally what's what what is the case so it wants to go down its concentration gradient as it leaves the cell the charge inside the cell becomes more and more negative in fact, how negative would be, would be the inside of that cell if potassium was freely permeable and allowed to go down its concentration gradient as much as possible, leaving behind those anions inside the cell, ultimately what would it reach? And so we can actually calculate that. We can calculate potassium's what we call equilibrium potential. All right. In other words, you know, what is the potential needed to be reached inside the cell to prevent the movement of potassium out of the cell. In other words, it becomes so negative inside the cell, it actually starts to attract the positive potassiums and prevents them from going down their concentration gradient. So what would that negative voltage have to be for specifically potassium? And so let's calculate that. Okay, so in order to calculate that, we're gonna be using that Nernst equation that I just mentioned. All right, so the Nernst equation is used to calculate the equilibrium potential. The equilibrium potential is also known as the reversal potential. And so there's a couple things about this equation. It can only calculate one single ion at a time. All right, so we can talk about sodium's equilibrium potential or potassium or chloride, and we can calculate each one separately. Uh, and it also assumes that every ion is 100% permeable. So it's allowed to just freely move into or out of the cell down its uh, concentration gradient. Okay, so it, it takes into that, that assumption. So the equation you can see is down here. All right, so this is uh, E for the equilibrium potential. All right, so right here. And the equilibrium potential is in millivolts because, again, the question we're asking is what is the voltage that needs to be reached in order to prevent an ion from moving down its concentration gradient? So a couple of things we need to know in order to fill in this equation, but let's talk about this whole equation first. Uh, the millivolts, all right, that's, again, the units we're using for the equilibrium potential. Uh, 
and this is negative 61 millivolts. So the negative 61 in this case will be a constant. Uh, taking in, uh, this is our you know pre-calculated constants like Faraday's constants, uh, the gas constant plus uh, our physiologic body temperature. Uh, so that's all been calculated for you, and it comes out to negative 61 millivolts over Z. Z is the valence of the ion in question. So for, for example, if we're talking about sodium, it would be one. If it's potassium, it's one. If it's magnesium or calcium, for example, it would be two, since they have a valence of two. And it's the log of the concentration of the inside of the cell over the concentration in the outside of the cell. So that's what the I and the O stand for inside and outside of the cell. And so they're taking into account the, the concentration difference, which is what I just talked about on the, the previous slide is that depending on that difference, okay, they, there would be a difference in their driving force. Therefore, there would be a difference in the amount of voltage it would take in order to uh, prevent it from going down that, uh, that concentration gradient. So down here, just to quickly, in the box here, this is also in the notes that I sent you guys, uh, we would just have to be, pay attention if we're talking about a cation versus an anion. So if you're calculating for chloride, for example, you just got to make sure to switch the ratio uh, to outside over inside, and if it's a cation, inside over outside in terms of concentration. It just helps us to not mess up uh, the sign, whether it's going to be negative or a positive voltage that we're talking about. Okay. So, again, this is the log of the concentration difference between the inside and the outside of the cell. All right. So, I give you the example over here, which I drew before you guys from before, uh, looking at sodium and potassium. And we're going to primarily be only focusing on sodium and potassium because these are going to be the two main ions that contribute to the membrane potential. However, that being said, any, any ion can contribute. But the primary ones for us physiologically are sodium and potassium. All right, so let's try a calculation using sodium, for example. So we want to calculate, calculate the uh, equilibrium potential or the reversal potential. So that would be negative 61 millivolts. All right, so if I take negative 61, I'm going to just draw it right above it. So I'll let, it's equal to negative 61 millivolts divided by the valence, the valence of sodium in this case. I should write over here. So it's the equilibrium potential of sodium. It's going to be a little Na there. That's one, right? And then we have the log of the concentration difference between the inside of the cell, since it's a cation. The inside of the cell is 14. It's the log of 14. Uh, millimoles per liter divided by 140 millimoles per liter. Okay, so now I'm going to draw that over here. So really what that comes out to is negative 61 millivolts, because that was only divided by 1. So that's times the log, and if we solve for that, it's going to be 0 0.1. All right, the log of 0 0.1 is actually negative, uh, negative 1. So again, I'll draw the last part over here. So it's negative 61 millivolts times the log of 0 0.1, which is times negative 1. So the equilibrium potential for sodium is equal to negative 61 times negative 1, which is 61 millivolts. So 61 millivolts is the equilibrium potential for sodium. Again, the assumption is that uh, sodium is freely permeable. It could just move through the membrane down its concentration gradient. And what 61 millivolts means, how do we interpret what 61 millivolts means? So let's take a look at that next. Okay, so let's see how we interpret that Nernst potential. So let's take the cell, for example. And as you know, inside the cell, uh, we had a concentration of sodium at about 14 millimoles per liter. And outside the cell is a higher concentration of sodium at 140 millimoles, millimoles per liter, which again is will be plugged into the, the Nernst potential. But we see that there's a concentration difference, which we calculated for, right? That was our ratio of concentrations in the Nernst potential equation, or the equilibrium potential. And so you know that sodium wants to go down its concentration gradient into the cell. Now we calculated an equilibrium potential. Equilibrium potential of sodium was equal to 61 millivolts. 
So what does that mean? Now, what that means is it would take a charge of plus 61 millivolts inside that cell in order to prevent any further movement of sodium down its concentration gradient with that different that that difference in concentration so for example at a, at a difference of concentration or a concentration gradient of 140 to 14 it would take 61 positive 61 millivolts inside that cell to keep sodium from moving down its gradient any further now we're at an equilibrium it's no longer going to move down its concentration gradient because it's being repelled by the positive charges that are accumulating inside the cell and so our equilibrium potential as we call it where we're now in equilibrium an electrochemical equilibrium is 61 millivolts so that's what it would take now the reason or the, to give you an example of why this depends on concentration is let's just say you can plug that back in you guys can try this for yourself but let's say instead of 140 out here let's make it 240 millimoles per liter and we'll keep the concentration of sodium inside the cell the same recalculate the nerds potential and what you'll find okay is that it's going to be higher than 61 millivolts all right it might be like 70 or 75 millivolts for example so it would take more positive charge to prevent that larger gradient from go, uh, from moving any further down its concentration gradient, or that much more voltage, positive voltage, to prevent sodium from going down a larger concentration gradient. And so that's how we kind of interpret the, the Nernst potential. Now you can do the same, same examples, and you can try this with uh, potassium, and I suggest you do take some practice working on these calculations. All right, so plug it in, use the concentrations that I have on the, the previous slide, and you can calculate what the equilibrium potential is for potassium. Okay, so as we looked at the NERD potential, it only takes into account one ion, and it assumes that that ion is 100% permeable, and we can reach an equilibrium potential uh, that way. However, our membrane potentials throughout our body are not usually equivalent to an equilibrium potential because not all ions are freely permeable and it's not just one ion that we have to take into consideration we have to take into consideration all the ions and their different permeabilities so it creates a little bit more complexity in, in how we come to a membrane potential of a given cell okay so for example if sodium and potassium are our, our two primary ions we'll focus on those all right if it's permeable to both sodium and potassium Okay, then a steady state is achieved, all right? Not an equilibrium potential, all right? In fact, if both sodium and potassium are, are permeable, sodium is moving into the cell, or it's moving positive charges in, and potassium is moving positive charges out. So they're kind of working against each other, and so they can never really fully uh, meet their equilibrium potential, but instead they'll reach what we call a steady state, where the number of positive charges coming into the cell and the number of positive charges exiting the cell uh, we'll come into sort of a steady state position, all right? We'll be equivalent to each other. And so the resting membrane potential, uh, like the negative 70 millivolts that I mentioned on the very first slide, uh, it's relative to the permeability of all ions across the membrane. Because like I said before, all ions can contribute to the membrane potential. The primary ones that we'll be talking about are sodium and potassium, of course, all right? So we have to take into consideration how permeable they are, okay? Uh, and their concentration gradients. So the concentration gradients, which we've kind of already talked about in terms of sodium and potassium, all right, that sets the upper, uh, upper and lower limits of the scale. Okay, what that means is uh, we can calculate their equilibrium potentials using the Nernst equation uh, and find out if, if they were 100% permeable and they were the only ion, what potential would they reach? What potential in the cell would be reached? And we calculated that with sodium, which came around, came out to about positive 60 millivolts. And if we calculated it out for potassium, it would come out to about 90 or 95, uh, negative 90 or 95 millivolts. And so we have two opposite extremes, one very positive, one very negative. Uh, and so that would be sort of the, the upper and lower limits. And since in physiology under normal healthy conditions, our concentrations don't really change all that much, um, that would be fairly consistent across the board. All right, so that would set our positive 60 to negative 90 so I'm going to just write it out here so our range 
is plus 60 all the way to negative, let's say negative 95 millivolts. This is in millivolts as well. All right, so this is the, the range, anywhere from here all the way to here. Anywhere between those two points, we could have a membrane potential. Now, if we have both sodium and potassium being permeable, well, now it's a matter of comparing their permeabilities, which is this ratio right here of the permeability of sodium relative to the permeability of potassium. That's going to set the steady state between the two equilibrium potentials. Right? That's going to mean, that's going to dictate where along that line between positive 60 millivolts and negative 95 millivolts, where we're going to fall. Okay? So for an example, let's say we're equally permeable to both sodium and potassium. Let's say they're both 100% permeable and freely permeable. Okay? So they have open channels at all times. And their concentration gradients, all right, are, are fairly similar to each other, actually. Uh, they're both positively charged, but they're moving in opposite directions, okay? So as potassium is moving out of the cell, sodium is moving inside the cell. So the question is, you know, where along this continuum from six positive 60 to negative 95 millivolts would the steady state fall if sodium is moving in and potassium is moving out? Well, in that case, since they have similar concentrations already, and they're moving in opposite directions, we're going to fall somewhere in the middle. Somewhere smack in the middle of plus 60 millivolts, which is the equilibrium potential for sodium. Remember, sodium is going to move down its concentration gradient into the cell uh, until it reaches its equilibrium potential. Potassium is going to go from high concentration inside the cell out of the cell until it reaches its equilibrium potential, which is negative 95. So they're both fighting to reach their equilibrium potentials. Okay. And uh, since they're both moving in, in opposite directions, what we end up having is, is they're meeting somewhere in the middle. We reach a steady state between the, the, the flow of ions in and out. And so that, that in this case, uh, along that continuum, that might be, let's say, uh, approximately negative 15 millivolts, we'll say. Somewhere right between positive 60 and negative 95. All right, so maybe, maybe the cell would come to rest at about negative 15 millivolts. But that, if we look over here, that's not the case. That's what is, that's what's happening here. In the in the example, most neurons are about negative 70. Other cells might be about negative 50. Uh, cardiac uh, myocytes they rest at about negative 90. Okay, so that's actually pretty close. Negative 90 is actually pretty close to the potassium equilibrium potential. So I'm going to come back to that point. Now, if you look at this box right here, the yellow box that I've highlighted. You can see, this is just to kind of give you a, a rough idea of the equilibrium potential of several ions. So sodium, approximately 60 millivolts, positive 60, which we calculated. Potassium is approximately negative 95. Chloride is approximately negative 90 millivolts. And calcium is about approximately 120 millivolts. Remember, that's the, that's the, the equilibrium potential represents the charge it would take inside the cell to prevent any ions from moving down their concentration gradient. The larger the concentration gradient, the larger the voltage. So you can actually take a look at the, the voltages and compare the size of the voltage, and you'd have a rough idea which one has a higher concentration gradient. So for example, in this case, sodium has the smallest concentration gradient, and calcium would have the largest because it takes 100 plus 120 millivolts, double what it took sodium, to prevent calcium from moving down its concentration gradient. It took a lot more positive charge. So we can also, you know, at least get some information that way. If we saw the equilibrium potential was very high, we could also um, surmise that that means that the concentration difference between the inside and the outside of the cell is also very high. Okay, here what I want to do is just kind of to reiterate something that I mentioned on the previous slide, which again, uh, you know, in order to reach a certain membrane potential, if I have multiple ions that are permeable across a membrane, it's the ratio of their permeabilities that's going to dictate the final steady state, which is our membrane potential. So, let me draw a cell here. All right. And, you know, as you know, we have sodium uh, wanting to move into the cell. We have potassium that wants to move, uh, move out of the cell, right, because it's in higher concentrations inside the cell. And if it were just potassium, and we said potassium is 100% permeable, we'll ignore sodium for a second. If it's just potassium allowed to move and move freely, all right, its equilibrium potential, according to the Nernst equation, would be about negative 95 millivolts. 
If I just looked at sodium and no other ion and it was also 100% permeable, okay, it was going to be plus 60 millivolts approximately, right? Now we have a wide range that I drew before between plus 60 and negative 95, all right? These are the equilibrium potential. So this would be the equilibrium potential for sodium, and this down here is the equilibrium potential for potassium, okay? And again, we reach a negative 95 equilibrium potential for potassium because as potassium goes down its concentration gradient out of the cell, the inside of the cell is going to become more and more negative. How negative does it have to be in order to prevent potassium going down its particular concentration gradient? Well, physiologically, that comes out to about negative 95 millivolts. Okay, so now let's, let's talk in terms of permeability. We know now that physiologically, both sodium and potassium can permeate the membrane, but they don't permeate to the same degree. They're not permeable to the same degree. Okay, they're not both 100% permeable. The example I gave on the previous slide was that if they're both 100% permeable, then we'd fall at a steady state that's somewhere in the middle here at around negative 15 millivolts, okay? However, that's not the case physiologically at all, all right? Our membrane potential does not is not negative 15 millivolts. In fact, in the example I've been giving, it's negative 70 for most neurons. So negative 70 would be down here. Let's just put a little hash mark there and say negative... 70 millivolts. So negative 70 millivolts, if you've noticed, is actually closer to the potassium equilibrium potential than it is to the sodium equilibrium potential. So this is important to understand because we are closer to the potassium equilibrium potential. And remember, the only way we can reach potassium equilibrium potential is if it's 100% permeable and there were no other ions moving, let's say, to kind of interfere with that process, right? If I made it 100% permeable, it would be negative, it would be all the way down to negative 95. However, I do have sodium moving in, and I said if they were both equally moving or permeable, they would meet in the middle somewhere. However, we're not meeting in the middle, we're meeting more towards potassium than we are towards sodium, which means the way we interpret this is that the permeability of potassium is greater so the permeability of potassium is greater than the permeability of sodium. Sodium is less permeable, and I've said this actually on the, on the earlier slides, that potassium is about 100 times more permeable than sodium. Now there's you know, more open channels for, pota uh, for potassium and so on. So uh, at least under these resting conditions, potassium is more permeable than sodium. And so since it's more permeable, it can actually drive the membrane potential closer towards its equilibrium potential. But since sodium can move in, it does have some permeability, it's not completely blocked, it prevents it from going all the way to its equilibrium potential because there are some sodium ions that are permeating. And so they reach a steady state now between the sodium ions that are moving in, all right, and the potassium that's moving out, but it's the potassium moving at a higher permeability, sodium at less permeability. But there will reach a steady state, and that steady state will be, you know, a negative number closer to the equilibrium potential of potassium. Now, one last thing I want to point out with this is that means that sodium, all right, let's say the inside of that's, the cell is negative 70, right? That's our steady state or our membrane potential, which means potassium, again, is more permeable than sodium. Sodium can get in. It just means that, you know, in terms of its permeability, it may have fewer channels that it can get through or fewer open channels. Okay, so it, it's, it has to get through fewer channels. Whereas potassium has a, a, a whole lot more channels and so it can move more readily through. It permeates easier. But the driving force for sodium to get into the cell is greater than the driving force for potassium to get out of the cell. So let me explain that. So the driving force... The driving force for potassium all right, is less than the driving force for sodium. The reason is this. Sodium wants to get to its equilibrium potential, which is positive 60 millivolts. It is very far away from that because it's at, the memory potential is at negative 70. So it's got a large difference between where it wants to get. 
So that means that the very negative inside of the cell at negative 70 millivolts attracts those positive sodium ions. And there's a concentration gradient of sodium wanting to get into the cell. So we have two factors working together. The high concentration of sodium concentration wanting to go into the cell, plus it's drawn or attracted to the very negative uh, internal uh, cell, the internal voltage of the cell, which is negative 70. So it really wants to get inside that cell with a lot of force, and we call that driving force. For example, if instead I change it from negative 70 millivolts and I made it negative 10 millivolts, sodium would still have a driving force due to its concentration and wanting to get inside the cell, but the driving force would be less because it's not as negative. It's not going to attract the positive ions as strongly. So it's a weaker driving force overall. But at negative 70, that's much larger difference, a much more negative internal cell, so the positive sodium ions are going to be really attracted to that. Now, in terms of potassium's driving force in that, in that case, remember, its equilibrium potential is negative 95. That means at negative 95, that's going to prevent any potassium from leaving the cell. Even though it might be permeable, it would have difficulty leaving simply because it's being held back by a very negative charge. At negative 70 millivolts, that's pretty close to its equilibrium potential already. So that means that potassium is a low driving force to get out. Even though there's a concentration gradient, it's being held back by a very, uh, very negative charge. Because remember, potassium is also positively charged. So it makes it difficult for the potassium to get out of a cell. Hopefully this slide will help to um, reinforce what I just said on the previous slide. So again, uh, creating this, this uh, gradients, concentration gradient, and depending on the charge inside the cell, that's going to um, create a, a certain driving force for ions. Okay, so to calculate it, really, it's just the, the whatever the membrane potential is. So on the previous slide, I said let's say it's negative 70, and whatever the equilibrium potential is for that ion. So the equilibrium potential for sodium is positive 60 millivolts. The at a negative 70 uh, millivolts. Uh, membrane potential that's a big difference between plus 60 and negative 70 so the driving force is really great and it's for the reasons that i described in the previous slide it's a very high concentration difference as well as the a very negative charge inside the cell which is going to attract those positive ions so it really wants in the cell so it's going to have what we call a very high driving force all right and so um so the force and the rate of diffusion increases across the membrane uh, for sodium okay and the further it is away from its equilibrium potential, the more force it's going to have. Okay. So actually in this little drawing here, this is actually from your notes. Okay. It's showing you a membrane potential down here. So it's saying, let's say if we held it at negative 100, and then there's point A, B, and then there's point C over here. And this is saying somewhere around here is about zero millivolts. So um, it becomes more and more positive as we go up. Let's just say, all right, this is potassium, for example. Potassium's equilibrium potential is approximately right around you know, 95. Let's say it's a negative 100 millivolts in this, in this example at point A. Let's say the voltage was, or the membrane potential, was around negative 70. Well, potassium wants out of the cell down its concentration gradient, and it's going to be held back by this sort of negative potential inside the cell. Its driving force is actually pretty small because it's pretty close to its equilibrium potential now. Okay, so it's not really, it doesn't have a whole lot of driving force to get out of the cell. However, if the membrane potential were uh, more positive, say this point, which is like negative 10 or something like that, that's further away from negative 95. It's not as negative a charge inside the cell, which can't hold back potassium from leaving the cell as easily. So the driving force becomes larger. And then lastly, at point C, if it was very positive inside the cell, say this this point c represented you know plus we'll say plus 30 millivolts for example that's a big difference between its uh, potassium's equilibrium potential which is negative 95 and positive 30 millivolts that very positive charge inside the cell would actually repel other positive charges like potassium so that would actually work in helping to push potassium out of the cell and so the driving force would be even larger so in other words the further we are from the equilibrium potential or the further the membrane potential is from the equilibrium potential the greater the driving force. Now this, this box over here, this is something I want you guys to take a look at uh, pretty closely because it helps to, this, to um, show you uh, how different voltages will affect the net flow of ions. All right, and so in this case, we're talking about potassium. 
So potassium's equilibrium potential, as you guys know, now at this point is about negative 95 millivolts. So we calculated that using the NERD's potential. So again, you know that potassium, what we have to understand is that potassium is in higher concentrations inside the cell than outside the cell. So it wants out of the cell. So that means that the concentration gradient, the, the out just means that it always wants out of the cell. So that's, that's fairly simple. It doesn't matter what the voltage is inside the cell. In terms of its concentration gradient, it always wants to go down its concentration gradient out of the cell. So that's, that's regardless of whatever the voltage is inside the cell. Now let's just say experimentally, we were to change the voltage inside of a cell and hold it there and then see how the flow of ions changed, the flow of potassium changed. We already know it's at high concentration inside the cell and it wants out, so we, we can kind of ignore that column for now. How does it affect, how does the electrical gradient now, by changing the voltage, how is that going to affect the net flow? So let's take an example. As I've already said before, if I, let's say I change the inside of the cell, its voltage to negative 12. Okay? That's less negative than negative 95. Okay? Potassium wants out of its cell, negative, negative 12 millivolts is not as negative as negative 95, and so therefore it's not as strong of a negative charge to hold back the potassium from going down its concentration gradient. So, yeah, it's a force that's going to try to hold the ions in a little bit because negative is attracted to the positive potassium ions. So we call this a very weak force. It's weakly trying to hold on to those potassium ions, but the concentration gradient again is out, and the net flow is going to be out because the concentration gradient is a much greater force than the, the charge in this case. If we're at zero, well, at zero, there's no electrical gradient, right? Because we're neither positive nor negative. So then it's only about the concentration gradient, which would be out. So it would just, the ions would flow outward down their concentration gradient. If we held the cell, the inside of the cell to plus 60 here, that means the inside of the cell down here would be positive 60 millivolts. That positive charge would repel the positive charge of the potassium and would try to force the potassium out of the cell. And already the potassium wants out of the cell because of its concentration gradient. So therefore, it repels it out of the cell, it wants out of the cell down its concentration gradient, so it would definitely go out of the cell. If I made it even more positive, it's the same principle. It would go out, but now it's just very strong, it's much more strongly pushing it out. And the gradient is again out, and so of course it would be out. Coming back to the equilibrium potential, if it's negative 95, that's a strong enough negative charge to be attracted to the positive potassium ions and hold it back from going down its concentration gradient, which wants out of the cell. There's no net flow there. So therefore, this is the equilibrium potential. There's no more net flow. And lastly, if I made it negative 100, so I made it more negative than its uh, equilibrium potential. That negative inside of the cell would very much attract, be attracted to the positive ions of potassium. So let's say it was a negative 100. So that would hold back the potassium from going, leaving the cell, more so than negative 95. So even though the gradient still wants it to go out, it's a very strong inward pull. And so that might, in that case, since it's greater or more negative than the equilibrium potential, that might actually pull ions in my pull ions into the cell. So what I'm going to have you guys do towards the end, and I'll show you guys, is, is try out this same chart, but using it for potassium. Oh, excuse me, using it for sodium. All right, the sodium-potassium pump. So now, again, we have ions moving down their concentration gradients. The cells themselves have to maintain the high concentration of sodium outside the cell and potassium inside the cell. So when I've been talking about you know things moving down their concentration gradients, um, it makes sense to think, well, once they move down their concentration gradients, they would have lower concentrations and so on. But that isn't the case physiologically because the cell is constantly uh, sending the ions back into their appropriate places. So for example, it's always resetting. It's always taking the potassium ions and moving them back inside the cell and it's taking the sodium ions from inside the cell and pumping them back out again. But it requires energy, so again, this is uh, uh, you know, an active transport. This is often referred to as the uh, sodium-potassium pump. 
this is ubiquitous. You're going to find these in all the different types of cells that we're going to talk about in physiology. And uh, the ratio of exchange is this. It takes three sodiums. So you can see three sodiums over here. It takes three sodiums from inside the cell and moves them out of the cell. In exchange, it takes two potassiums and moves them inside the cell. So it's a, it's a, three, to, a three and two exchange. So three positive sodium ions out of the cell for two positive potassium ions inside the cell. And so this helps to maintain those gradients, okay, and also helps to, to reset them as ions continue to move. And so this constantly requires energy and ATP to keep this functioning and to maintain those gradients. Because if we start to diminish the gradients, if we lose the gradient, you're going to lose the potential difference. And you can calculate that in the NERDS potential. You can take the concentration gradients, and if the inside and the outside are the same, okay, log of one is zero, okay. So log one again is zero, so that would uh, mean the, there's no equilibrium potential. Now, we call this also an electrogenic pump. The reason is this. We talked about a steady state, and the steady state is going to make our membrane potential because it's based on sodium and potassium's movements and relative permeabilities to one another. And so as we start to accumulate you know, sodiums inside the cell, we have to move them out, and potassium is going to move them back in. But it doesn't do it in an equal distribution. It's moving three positive sodiums. All right, so the sodium is moving three of them for two of them moving back inside the cell. So we're moving three positives out of the cell and only replacing it with two positive ions, which actually leaves us with a net negative one charge inside the cell. Okay, again, because if I remove three positives and I only replace it with two positive ions, I have a net loss of one positive ion. Okay, so that net uh, loss of positive ion does contribute to the membrane potential as well. So it's not just the, uh, the movement of sodium and potassium inside and outside of the cell, but this pump itself can actually bring the membrane potential a little bit more negative simply because it's removing one extra positive ion that it's replacing. So for example, maybe the uh, steady state between sodium potassium flow or permeabilities would reach, let's say, 65, uh, negative 65 millivolts. The electrogenic pump or the sodium potassium pump would bring it to about negative 70 uh, millivolts. So it doesn't add as much to the negative uh, membrane potential, maybe about five millivolts or so. But it has a very important role in making sure it maintains the gradient so we can uh, have that flow to begin with. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, some cells in our body will also utilize uh, membrane potentials to help carry out its basic cellular processes. We tend to think of um, these types of processes occurring in just conductive cells like neurons uh, or muscle cells, which you know, we'll, talk, we'll talk about. And, uh, but in this case, this is sort of an example where we have a, a membrane potential that helps to um, bring other substances against their gradient. So for example, here, let's say this was in the intestines or even in the kidney, you can see this type of function, where you have our primary active transport, which is our sodium potassium pump. That's creating the gradient. So we have high sodium concentration outside the cell relative to the inside. Once we have that sodium gradient established, remember it has a driving force. If that driving force, and now a lot of the cells in our body uh, for example, like the neurons were negative 70 millivolts membrane potential. You have skeletal muscles about negative 90. Many of the non-conducting cells might be around like, let's say, negative 50 millivolts inside the cell. Now, at negative 50 millivolts, again, the equilibrium potential for sodium is about plus 60. So it still has a very strong driving force. And this negative potential in here helps to keep that driving force for sodium high. So when sodium helps to carry or binds to these other transporters, it helps to bind to and drag things like glucose against their gradient where they might be at high concentration in certain cells. Okay, so it helps to bring them in. And so we call that secondary active transport. Now, uh, in the kidney, you know, we, we make sure that we reabsorb all the glucose that gets filtered into the kidney. We don't want any of the glucose ending up in our urine, which means that the cells lining the tubules, okay, 
have to do a, a good job of making sure they reabsorb all that glucose. And so glucose can be in very high concentrations in those cells lining those tubules. And so in order to make sure we can still bring in as much glucose as possible, despite there being a lot inside the cells already, we need to have this sodium gradient so it drives this glucose inside the cell. And so you're going to see a lot of different cellular processes throughout physiology where we're going to link the, the gradient that is formed by, say, the sodium-potassium pump and link it to, to uh, activities that helped us to, to go bring molecules against their gradient. So in summary, there's two determinants to membrane potential. There's the concentration gradient, okay, which we saw that in the inert potential. Uh, so particularly of sodium and potassium, and then the permeability of sodium and potassium, right? So those are those two determinants there. The concentration gradients, uh, overall, they hardly change in healthy individuals, right? So uh, we usually can keep that fairly consistent, but the permeabilities, on the other hand they can change frequently due to channels opening and closing. So even though there may be, let's say, a predetermined number of channels for sodium or potassium, uh, they might change their, their open times. You know, some may stay open longer and some may be closed. All of them may open suddenly and then all of them close. So they can actually change permeabilities moment to moment based on uh, signals from other cells, for instance. Uh, they might be able to increase the number of you know, channels that they have in their membrane, or they might bring, you know, downregulate them. So they can change and alter the permeabilities, and that can actually change the characteristics and even change membrane potentials. So we're going to talk a little bit further now in terms of an action potential and the mechanisms that the body uses to change membrane potentials, for example, in an action potential. And that has to do with changing the permeabilities. Since we don't change the concentrations at all because those are physiologically set, what the cells can do then is change the permeabilities. By altering the permeability of sodium potassium, we can actually have the classic pattern of an action potential, for example. So that's what we're going to talk about next. So to begin, uh, just some terminology. Uh, at rest, the cell is considered polarized, right? So if we're taking a neuron, for example, at negative 70 millivolts, um, relative to the outside of the cell, which is zero millivolts, the cell is considered polarized, okay? Uh, the membrane potential is considered to be larger or greater the further it is from zero, all right? Now, depolarization refers to membrane becoming more positive, or in other words, less negative. Since they're all resting at negative potentials, like negative 70, if it becomes less negative, like negative 55 or negative 30, that's considered uh, depolarizing. Uh, hyperpolarization refers to a membrane potential becoming more negative, okay, or it's getting larger. So that would be if the resting membrane potential is negative 70, if it suddenly becomes negative 80, it's hyperpolarizing. It's further from zero. So now in electrical signals in neurons, all right, so these are excitable cells. They can communicate with each other via action potentials or something called a graded potential. All right, um, you'll see similar things in, in uh, myocytes, which are also uh, excitable cells, and we'll have a different lecture on that. So this is going to be talking strictly about uh, neurons right now. So action potentials allow communications over short and long distances, all right, because action potentials can propagate along axons of neurons, all right? Whereas these graded potentials, this, these are where communication occurs over short distances uh, within a neuron, for example. So instead of traveling along a very long axon, it might only occur very locally on a, on, on a cell somewhere. The production of an action potential or graded potential depends on the existence of a resting uh, membrane potential and the existence of specific ion channels. So, uh, so again, most neurons are going to be around negative 70, so I'm going to be using that as my sort of average uh, resting membrane potential. And we're going to have, we're going to see that there are specific ion channels now. Uh, namely, we're going to be talking about sodium and potassium and how they're triggered, and they'll open and close in response to those triggers, and how that's going to shape uh, or change the, the, the membrane potential. So just briefly, this is an overview of, of a, a neuron. I know you'll probably go over this more in anatomy, but here you can see this is a, a one kind of a neuron. There are a multitude of different types of neurons and shapes, uh, and shapes and sizes, okay? But here, just to kind of go over some basics, 
This would be the, the body of the neuron over here, otherwise known as the soma, and you can see the nucleus there, you can see all the organelles inside of it, and the mitochondria. And then coming off of the body or the soma of the neuron, you can see the dendrites, which stick outward in these directions here, they look like little branches. All right, so these dendrites. And these are actually where uh, communication occurs on the neuron for the most part, where other neurons, for example, will communicate with this neuron via the dendrites. So it'll make a connection to those dendrites and communicate there. And over here, this little segment right here is referred to as the axon hillock. So that's the connection point between the soma and the axon. And then you can see the axon, you can see a little bit of an axon collateral or a little branch over, over in this region right here, but uh, you see the axon. All right, this really long tail it kind of looks like is the axon. And when you get to the end of the axon, you can see the axon terminal. So these are referred to as synaptic end bulbs. And these would communicate with, say, another neuron and its dendrites, or it would communicate with, say, a gland uh, or another muscle to kind of help carry out some sort of process, right? like salivating, for example, or contraction of a muscle. On the axon, uh, this is where action potentials would propagate. And so, you know, they would form here at the hillock and then propagate all the way down the, the axon to the very end where a neurotransmitter would be released, for example. Now, you'll notice that along the axon, they have, all right, here, the Schwann cells in this case, uh, which are um, cells that myelinate the axon. And so myelination, as we'll discuss at the end of this lecture, help to speed up that conduction time. And in between the myelin, you have the nodes of Ranvier, all right, which for lack of a better term, means the action potential will basically jump from node to node and skip portions of the axon, which helps to speed it up. In terms of the ion channels, all right, I mentioned this before, but I'm going to bring it up again now, is that there's the ligand-gated channel. Again, you know, hormone, neurotransmitter, second uh, messenger or something will bind to that channel, and it opens up immediately an ion channel. And that ion channel can be very specific and allow only sodium or potassium, or it can be somewhat mixed and allow several different types of ions to move in or out of the cell. Okay. Uh, so, you know, over here you can see the ligand, you see you can bind there, and once it opens up, it allows the, you know, the flow. So here if the, the ligand is acetylcholine, uh, this this binding opens up the channel and allows ions to move. So maybe potassium in this example is, is, can move through it and go down its concentration gradient outside of the cell. Meanwhile, sodium moves you know, through it and goes inside the cell. Voltage-gated channels, what I described earlier, so I won't spend too much time on this, that depends on the voltage inside of the cell. So here at negative 50, you notice this gate here opened and allowed ions to move. And again, they can be very specific. It could allow just potassium or sodium and so on. Now, graded potentials, all right? Sometimes these are also referred to as local potentials. And what that really just means is that these are uh, changes in the membrane that occur very locally on a cell, all right? In this instance, so very locally on a neuron. So, so maybe it's happening locally on a, on a dendrite somewhere or locally on the cell body or the soma of the neuron. So these, these happen just in these localized areas. So if we're looking at this cartoon down here, these are the dendrites. It might be you know, happening just at the very end of that dendrite right there. You get these little changes in the membrane potential. So that's an important point is understanding that some of these neurons can be quite large. And when the membrane potential changes, uh, it changes locally at that site. The whole cell's membrane potential doesn't just change, okay? It just happens locally. And uh, so that, that's sort of an important point to make right now. So these graded potentials can change the membrane potential at a local site. And that's based on, you know, what's interacting at that site. So again, it can occur at dendrites or soma, which is most typical. They can be excitatory or inhibitory. So with, we'll kind of discuss more about what that means, but uh, in, in essence, if it's an excitatory stimulus, that means it's going to bring it closer to firing an action potential. If it's inhibitory, it brings it further away from firing an action potential. So we'll describe that in more detail. Uh, these graded potentials can occur at distal branches of sensory neurons, for example. They can occur at the neuromuscular junction, which we'll talk about. Uh, and then, of course, they can, they can occur between neurons at the dendrites and the soma. Now, the uh, graded potential. So this is graphically just going to represent what I was talking about. So imagine that we're at one of those little sites on the dendrite. Uh, and what has to happen here for this graded potential to occur is there has to be a ligand binding to the channel. 
on these neurons. So for example, let's say we have acetylcholine that was released from another neuron. The acetylcholine then binds to the channel, the ion channel, in the dendrite of a neuron. When it binds to that channel, it opens it up and a certain ion will flow. Okay, so here, let's take a look at this graph here. So this is time down here in milliseconds because this is happening very quickly. All right, and you have here millivolts. And so you'll notice here at negative 70, that's our resting membrane potential of our cell. So at negative 70 millivolts, when a ligand bound to the channel, the channel opened up temporarily. Look what happens here. You'll see that in red there, that little deviation going down went more negative. Remember, more negative means hyperpolarizing. So it hyperpolarized here. And then it reset itself back to, at this point here. Okay. Now how am I going to re, how am I going to hyperpolarize a cell? So if a cell is already at negative 70 millivolts and I open up a channel, so a ligand binds, open up a channel, well what do you think happened at that channel? Well, really one of one of two things could have happened. That channel that opened allowed negative ions into the cell. Like let's say chloride ions came in. So chloride ions moved into the cell. Those negative ions made the cell even more negative or made that portion of the cell even more negative, right? So it went from negative 70 to negative 75, for example. Or when it, the channel opened, it allowed positive ions to leave. So potassium, for example. If potassium leaves, uh, it's going to lose positive ions and therefore become more negative. So that could also cause a hyperpolarization. And it's a graded potential, and the graded potentials tend to be just like little blips, but we call it graded for a reason. It's graded because it's, it's, uh, it's the, the size or the amplitude of that deviation depends on the strength of the stimulus. And by strength of the stimulus, I mean, you know, how many neurotransmitters bound to how many receptors and how long were they open. If it's just a few and they weren't open for very long, I might get a little blip, a little deviation. If they're on bound for a while and I've opened up a whole bunch, I could see a much larger deviation. Over here, uh, you see that we have a, um, a depolarizing stimulus. You'll notice that it's green and it's making it less negative. It's going from negative 70 to say negative 60. So what could cause that? Well, if the ligand binds to the channel, it opens up and say positive ions flow into the cell, that's gonna make it less negative, right? So things like sodium or calcium, for example. So as I pointed out before, this is going, these graded potentials occur in response to a ligand-gated ion channel. So again, some hormone or neurotransmitter had to bind to it, open up a channel uh, in order to cause changes in the membrane potential by allowing negative or positive ions to flow in or out of the cell. The example they're giving here, you know, like acetylcholine, uh, acetylcholine could be excitatory, for example, because by exciting the cell, it's opening up a channel that's causing it to uh, become depolarized or less negative. Becoming less negative means it brings it closer to a possible uh, firing of an action potential. On the other hand, ones like glycine or uh, GABA, for example, when they bind, they tend to hyperpolarize a the cell. They tend to make it more negative and so therefore bring it further away from an action potential. And as mentioned earlier, uh, the stimulus strength uh, that depends on you know the amount of neurotransmitter, how long it binds for, you know how many receptors there, how many channels there are, and so on. Uh, so that's what we're kind of referring to with the stimulus strength. And the amplitude of the graded potential depends on that stimulus strength, right? So just a small amount of you know channels opening up might give me this little deviation you see here in green, but then a, you know a much larger release of neurotransmitter and more channels being open would give me an even larger amplitude, and so on, because it's allowing more exchange. Of positive ions or negative ions. So here you can see the stimulus strength that, that's associated with it. Okay, and what that really means is like if I stimulate a neuron, it releases a whole lot of neurotransmitter. Uh, it's going to bind to and, and activate a whole bunch of channels, and I can get a very strong response. So we can also have something called summation with graded potentials. All right, so in other words, they can just be, their amplitudes can be added together. So in this example, if my resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts, I give a stimulus at this point right there, stimulus one, and you'll notice that in this case, it's giving me a depolarization. So it's an excitatory type stimulus. And instead of letting it go back to baseline, which you see is the dotted line there, instead of letting the cell recover and you know get rid of those positive ions back out of the cell, 
Instead, I stimulate it again before it's had a chance to recover at this point right here. And you notice it goes up even further. In other words, I didn't give it time to recover, and when I stimulated it again, I opened up more channels, and the additional positive ions that got added to the cell overall give me an even larger change in the, the membrane potential. And that you can keep doing that. I could give another stimulus and add another one on top of that. So this brings me finally to uh, the action potential itself. So that was up to this point was all graded potentials. So with graded potentials, they happen locally with their ligand gated uh, channels, and it causes these sort of blips or changes in the membrane potential. For an action potential to occur, I need a graded potential again. So down here, negative 70 millivolts, that's my resting membrane potential. At this point right here, down there, that's the graded potential still. I have some sort of excitatory stimulus, some ligand bound to the, the channel and allowed uh, depolarization. And you notice I went from negative 70 to about negative 55 here, and you see these dotted line in purple here. All right, it says negative 55. What happened when the graded potential reached negative 55 millivolts, or depolarized it to negative 55 millivolts? You'll notice that I went through an action potential. I have depolarization all the way up to this point here, which is plus 30 millivolts. At which point, then it then repolarizes and even hyperpolarizes below baseline. Right, so if negative 70 millivolts here is the resting membrane baseline, it went below that, so that's what the hyperpolarization is, and then came back to the baseline. This is a classic looking uh, neuronal action potential. Okay, And so what we call this negative 55 here, all right, is we're getting graded potentials. These ligands are binding to the channels, they're opening up and letting, say in this case, positive ions in like sodium, for example. The cell is becoming less and less negative, and let's say the stimulus is strong enough that it becomes negative 55. Well, that negative 55 is referred to as a threshold potential. And it's a threshold because it's going to cause the action potential to occur. Once the action potential occurs, that is what we call an all or none response. We're going to get that same characteristic waveform every single time. Okay, so I want you to quickly look at this graph right here. And it's showing you the action potential, which I described on the previous slide. So you can see here in blue, this is the action potential. All right, just ignore the, the red and green one for now. You can see here, this is the resting membrane potential, which is on average negative 70 millivolts. This point right here, this upward going slope that you're seeing, that's carried out by the graded potentials, which require ligand gated channels. So again, so let's say a neurotransmitter bounds to the channel, it's letting sodium in, sodium's a positive ion, that makes the membrane potential less negative, and so at this point we reach what we call a threshold potential, which is negative 50. You see that at this point right here, threshold potential is reached, and an action potential is fired, so the upward slope is called depolarization, and the downward is called repolarization, and there's a slight hyperpolarization right here, and then return to baseline over here. So let's describe what's happening at the threshold at that point there when we reach negative 50 millivolts. When the graded potential is large enough to reach the threshold potential, that's the threshold potential for voltage-gated channels. In this case, it would be a voltage-gated <coughs> sodium channel. So when the graded potential reaches that, now it's going to activate voltage-gated sodium channels. They open up suddenly, and it, it allows a very rapid influx of sodium down its concentration gradient into the cell. Of course, uh, those positive ions entering into the cell are going to create a uh, a positive um, membrane potential. And in fact, if it remained open, it would drive it towards the equilibrium potential, which is about plus 60 millivolts. But instead, in this example, it drives it to about, let's say, you know, plus 40 millivolts or plus 50 millivolts. So it doesn't quite reach its equilibrium potential because what happens at this point at the top is that voltage gated sodium channels uh, inactivate. All right, this is a property of the, these voltage-gated channels at these high voltages, it inactivates. So this happens very rapidly. They open up, all right? They open in response to hitting the threshold. They let in you know, a large influx of sodium, or very rapidly let in sodium, reaches a very high or a very positive voltage, at which point it turns off very rapidly or it in, inactivates. So it inactivates. And at the same time, while this is the sodium channels are inactivating at the peak here, Voltage-gated 
potassium channels are opening. So they're a little bit delayed. They're opening, all right? They're opening there at the very top of the action potential. And when potassium now opens up, remember potassium is inside the cell. So when voltage gated potassium channels open up, now the inside of the cell, I can draw it over here. Now at the peak, the inside of the cell is say plus 50 millivolts, right? It's plus 50 millivolts. Potassium wants out of the cell and it's already very positive inside the cell. So the driving force for potassium is very great to get out of the cell. So potassium at this point, the voltage gated potassium channels open and potassium leaves the cell. As positive ions are leaving it, that causes the repolarization or the downward slope that you're seeing here. And these voltage gated potassium channels stay open a little bit longer. And as they stay open, it can continue to drive the cell more and more negative as we lose more and more potassium ions to the point where it starts to hyperpolarize the, the cell and drive it towards the potassium equilibrium potential, which would be about negative 95 millivolts. Uh, at which point they shut off and the cell is able to recover. The recovery phase is really the cell redistributing the ions. It's taking the sodium out of the inside of the cell and pumping it back out in exchange for those two potassiums that it's bringing back in. And so that helps to reset everything. And so what you're seeing here in red and green, those waves are the, um, the permeabilities of sodium and potassium. So the permeability of sodium, you'll notice, is really great when we, in, when we hit the threshold potential and activate the voltage-gated sodium channels. And you'll notice at the peak of the action potential, the permeability of sodium is at its peak, and it also then the permeability decreases as we repolarize because the voltage-gated uh, channels are now inactive. And the potassium permeability, you'll notice it's a little bit delayed. Its, its permeability goes up at the peak of the action potential. So that's when potassium is leaving the cell. It's more permeable. It's getting out of the cell. It's leaving. And you see how uh, its kinetics are a little bit slower and it's a little bit more gradual, so it takes a little bit longer for it to turn off. But that's what's repolarizing the cell and ultimately hyperpolarizing the cell. So uh, in all, again, as a summary, at negative 70 millivolts, right, uh, we have graded potentials that reach a threshold. The threshold activates voltage-gated sodium channels, which turn off at the peak. The voltage-gated potassium channels open and uh, that helps to repolarize the cell. So normally in class I would kind of quiz you guys on what's going on here, but I'll just take you through it briefly. So here again is our action potential. Here's our baseline. Our negative 70 uh, millivolts is our resting membrane potential. This is, you notice it's referring to as a local potential, which is our graded potential. So that's point one is the graded potential. The graded potential in this case is excitatory because we're getting closer to our threshold, which is in this case negative 55 millivolts. So that's the threshold. Once threshold is reached, we open up voltage gated sodium channels at point two. We get re, uh, depolarization as sodium ions are flooding inside the, the, the neuron there at point three. Point four, the voltage gated sodium channels inactivate or turn off. And at the same time, the potassium voltage gated channels open up. And when they open up potassium, there's an efflux of potassium out of the cell. So we get repolarization uh, during phase five there, some hyperpolarization during phase six since the potassium channels stay open for a little while. And then we're back to our baseline at point seven. And so that is the action potential. And so again, the uh, depolarizing phase is inward. All right, that's the movement of sodium. The repolarizing is potassium channels of the potassium moves outward, okay? The after hyperpolarizing phase is just prolonged time of the potassium channels, as I've mentioned. And so this little cartoon kind of takes you through the same process here. But you know, I just want to, to point out here that in general, as these action potentials are taking place, it's occurring or they're being initiated here at the axon hillock, which is where the you know there's a density of voltage-gated channels located there. And so you get graded potentials occurring throughout the dendrites and even the soma of the cell. And so if you get strong enough stimulus or stimuli, uh, that can trigger the axon hillock and those voltage-gated uh, channels uh, to open up, and then we can get an action potential, which can then propagate or move down the axon towards the terminal, at which point when it reaches the terminal, we'll release neurotransmitter. Um, the last thing I want to point out here before I move on is that this is sort of color-coded, and you'll notice with this color here, which coincides with this, 
we are in what we refer to as an absolute refractory period. Okay, and then over here in the this phase over here, we're in a relative refractory period. Okay, the absolute refractory period means that during that time I cannot fire another action potential regardless of how strong the graded potential stimulus is. Okay, because those voltage gated channels are turned off, they're inactive, so regardless of how depolarized the cell may be at that point, it will not fire again until the absolute refractory period is over and we're in the relative refractory period. I mean, if the neuron is already recovered it can, or the action potential is recovered, we can fire another one, no problem. But if we're in the relative refractory period where we're still slightly hyperpolarized, it would take an, uh, a, a larger than normal stimulus to fire an action potential during that time. Now, the reason again for that absolute refractory period is because we have what we call activation and inactivation of the voltage gated channels. So when sodium voltage gated sodium channels are activated at threshold, which is uh, you know negative 55 millivolts, for example, uh, you have what we call our resting state. Okay, and you see here the activation gate is closed, and that's inside the channel. And so what happens is once we re reach threshold, so we have graded potential that's now depolarized us to negative 55 millivolts, the activation gate opens up, and sodium uh, moves in very rapidly and causes that depolarizing spike that you see in the action potential. Now at the peak of that action potential, what happens is you'll see this little ball and chain cartoon down here. You'll notice that it moves. It moves into the ch in the way of the channel and plugs up that hole there. And this is actually called the inactivation gate. All right, this little ball and chain thing here is a, an inactivation gate. And that shuts the channel at the peak of the action potential. So it turns it off so no more ions can flow, and that's why you see it only goes up to about positive 30 millivolts or so, and then it stops. All right? And then what it's not showing you here is the potassium, the voltage-gated potassium channels, but they would open up uh, at the peak. Or I'm sorry, they are showing it here. Uh, here's the potassium channels here, which would be open. So they'll open up, and potassium can then leave the cell at the peak of the action potential, which you're seeing as the, as the downward movement of that action potential. So it's starting to repolarize. Again, the potassium channel is still open. We're repolarized. And after we repolarize back past the threshold, once we, go in, we, we repolarize past the threshold, which is negative 55 millivolts, you'll notice that the inactivation gates start to reopen and the activation gates have closed. So it's reset. Okay. So again, kind of in summary, activation gates opens in response to the reaching threshold. Once we reach the peak of the action potential, as, as you can see down here, uh, the inactivation gate will then close that and the potassium voltage gated channels will open up and repolarize the cell. Once it repolarizes it past the threshold again, so it's becoming more and more negative and it goes past negative 55 again, uh, the activation gate will close again and the inactivation gate will open and so everything is reset to where it was previously. In terms of stimulus strength, as I mentioned before, uh, you know, with the um, absolute and relative refractory periods, we cannot stimulate another action potential while we're in the middle of the, ref uh, the absolute refractory period. So here, if this is our resting memory potential, you see here's a graded potential. That graded potential was not strong enough to reach threshold, so it simply was just like a little blip, if you will. Once we have a strong enough stimulus to reach threshold, we fire an action potential. Right, so here you see a, a sub, what we call a sub-threshold stimulus, which coincides with this right here. And then the threshold stimulus, which was strong enough to elicit an action potential. All right, that's just a stronger graded potential. However, if the graded potential, or you know, let's say we have enough ligand opening enough channels, lets in enough uh, depolarizing stimulus, or enough sodium ions, for example, to depolarize the cell, and it's, it's maintained for a long period of time, Okay, what's going to happen is you're going to increase the frequency of action potential firing, but you're not going to increase the amplitude. It's not summative. It's not like a graded potential where one can add on to the other, simply because of the characteristics of the voltage-gated channels turning on and turning off at very distinct points doesn't allow for it. So instead, if you have a very strong stimulus that was maintained, so the cells maintained depolarized for a long period of time, every time the um, the action potential reset back to the to 
baseline, it would fire again. So it would just increase the frequency with which it fires, but not the amplitudes. This is coming back to that refractory period again. It's just a you know, clearer picture to show you that the area highlighted in pink here is the absolute refractory period. And again, it doesn't matter. You can stimulate all you want at this time point here. If, as long as we're in the absolute refractory period, no action potential will fire because the voltage-gated sodium channels are all inactive. However, as we're repolarizing, you notice this shaded area in blue over here. Uh, as we repolarize below the threshold point, which is this is right here about the, the membrane, the threshold for the membrane uh, potential, you'll see that, say that's like negative 55, negative 55. As we get near to that threshold as we're repolarizing, some of those inactivated voltage-gated sodium channels will start to reactivate and reset. And uh, as they start to reset, would be able to stimulate again. So it's a relative refractory period. It wouldn't be an easy way to stimulate. It would take a larger than normal stimulus, but it could still fire during that time period. So in terms of action potential versus graded potential, graded potentials are not propagated. In other words, they don't move along the action, uh, me, along an axon, for example. Uh, it won't activate a whole series of channels and continue. Uh, graded potentials are not self-terminating. An action potential is self-terminating, meaning it always, right, when it has its peak, it shuts off, right, the voltage gate channels, and then it repolarizes. Um, they're not self-terminating. Uh, what happens is you have to have other channels involved in kind of resetting all the ions. Graded potentials can summate. Action potentials don't summate, as I mentioned. Uh, graded potentials' uh, response is decremental, meaning it diminishes. So let's say we had a small stimulus to an area of a dendrite. That might only affect that local area, but as it moves further away, as those ions kind of dissipate inside the cell and move further along, uh, the response or the, the effect it has on the voltage decreases. And so it has a what we call a decremental effect um, from that site of stimulus. Whereas an action potential along the axon does not decrement at all. It doesn't diminish. It's the same action potential the whole way down the axon. So it's the same amplitude the whole way down, regardless of the, the length of the axon. And that's due to the fact that the channels and uh, the voltage gate channels are set up in such a way as to maintain that signal. But there's no such maintaining of a signal of a graded potential. So this is showing you that conduction down the axon. So the action potential itself, so you know that I mentioned before we have you know myelinated axon, but we also have unmyelinated axons. We'll get more into that a little bit later, but the uh, unmyelinated would be very much slower than a myelinated axon. So the myelinated axons, you can see over here, so let's, you know, so we have these little myelins, myelin sheets that you can see, and they leave a little space in between them called the nodes of Ranvier. And so what happens is you have clusters at the nodes of Ranvier, clusters of voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels. And so they get activated at the axon hillock there, and it'll essentially bounce from one to the other in a process we call a saltatory conduction. And so that makes it move very rapidly all the way to the end of the neuron, wherein it will then activate the release of neurotransmitter. And so it doesn't lose its amplitude the whole way down, and it moves very, very rapidly. Now, in unmyelinated axons, they will also transmit that signal all the way to the end, and it's the same process, it's just slower. So what ends up happening is it has to move segmentally you know, one little piece of the axon at a time to the different clusters of voltage-gated channels as it moves piece by piece. Um, and so it's a much slower conduction. Now, it doesn't move backwards, right? You'll notice that the action potential always moves in this direction. It doesn't go backwards towards the body uh, simply because as, um, because as one area, let's say this area was activated to fire an action potential, it then goes into a refractory period. And then the voltage-gated channels that are neighboring it will then activate. And then they'll go into a refractory period. And so that refractory period prevents it from going backwards. So the ones that have previously activated will be refractory. So that way it's always moving in, in, you know, in the direction towards the, uh, the axon terminal. Right? And you can see that in the cartoon over here. You'll see the electrical signal is just showing you the, the relative speeds to one another. Now myelination, uh, myelin sheath uh, actually electrically insulates the axon of a neuron and increases the speed of the nerve impulse or action potential 
uh, conduction. Now, in the peripheral nervous system, you have what we call Schwann cells, and in the central nervous system, you have oligodendrocytes. These are the cells that do, uh, myelinate the axon. So in the peripheral nervous system, meaning out in the periphery of the body, like you know, in, the, in the limbs, for example, or in the organs of the body, any, any of the neurons that have essentially exited from the spinal cord of the brain, um, they would be myelinated by Schwann cells. And these are individual cells, as you can see over here in the cartoon, these are individual cells that wrap around and create this myelin sheath. So you can see that that sheath is in yellow there. And that actually helps to insulate the axon. All right, and the oligodendrocytes are like octopus type shaped cells in the central nervous system, like the brain and the spinal cord, that can also you know, myelinate the axon and creates these nodes that allow conduction to jump from node to node. So you can see here in the uh, PNS, which is the peripheral nervous system, we have the Schwann cell. And in the central nervous system, you have the oligodendrocyte. The oligodendrocyte, as I mentioned before, is kind of like an octopus. It has multiple arms, and it can actually uh, produce myelin on multiple different axons of neurons. Whereas in the peripheral nervous system, the Schwann cell, it's one single Schwann cell for every single uh, section of myelin. So, for example, this is the peripheral nervous system. This would be one Schwann cell, this would be another Schwann cell, and another one, and so on. So, these are all Schwann cells that have to do that, whereas oligodendrocytes can myelinate multiple segments on multiple neurons. All right. So, the factors that affect the propagation speed. Okay, so in terms of uh, uh, myelination, again, if it has myelin, it's going to increase conduction versus no myelin. But then there's the amount of myelin. The more myelin you have, typically the faster it's going to move um, to a point. Temperature. If you increase the temperature, it conducts faster. Okay. Um, the axon diameter. Not all axons or neurons are created equally. Some, some axons are, are very large and have a very large diameter. And this actually helps action potentials to propagate faster than if the axon diameter were smaller. So some of the fastest that we have in our body are actually skeletal muscle nerves. So these are the, the neurons that innervate our skeletal muscles. And they will uh, usually prop, uh, conduct nerve impulses very, very rapidly because they have a lot of myelin and they also have um, very large axon diameter. Now just kind of a, a clinical correlate to myelination. Uh, some of the diseases of myelination you may have heard of, uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, MS. So this affects myelination in the central nervous system. So this can affect uh, the brain, spinal cord, and then they can have um, various phenotypes or various symptoms from that. Uh, oftentimes, you know, things that may change, you know, their, their vision or something. Uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Now Guillain-Barre uh, is another type of demyelinating disease, that, but this occurs in the peripheral nervous system. Oftentimes, this is uh, due to the immune system attacking uh, the Schwann cells, and uh, it occurs usually starting from the, the lower extremities in the legs and tends to migrate upward towards the chest. It's very dangerous because although when it starts in the limbs, it may produce like a weakness, so they might feel like their, their feet aren't responding appropriately and then their legs feel very weak. Um, their arms might start to feel weak, but when it gets into the chest area, it can also affect the diaphragm. And if it affects the diaphragm, they can have trouble breathing and actually suffocate. Uh, so that would be more of a, a, an emergency. So it's a, a diagnosis that needs to be made quickly, and uh, uh, interventions have to happen as quickly as possible to prevent that. What you see in the picture there is actually an MRI. And it's not a very clear MRI simply because there's a motion artifact. And you might have, you know, if you've, if you've worked in radiology before, you may have picked up on that already. But you can see these little lines here kind of look like ripples. Uh, that's actually just kind of uh, a distortion because the person was moving in the MRI. And it's not unheard of because MRIs can take a while. But then you see these lesions here, all right? So those are lesions that can be seen sometimes on an MRI study when you see uh, patients with multiple sclerosis. Now, here is just the case that I want you guys to take a look at. Uh, I know we haven't done anything on ECGs yet, so I don't expect, uh, you know, perfect interpretations of this or anything like that. But take a look at this. I'm giving you a, a potassium concentration. I'm giving you the ECG. And I'm asking you to calculate a, a, a NERDS potential based on some of the concentrations I'm giving. 
and I'm going to ask some other questions uh, based on that and uh, and also take a look at this this is the chart that I did for potassium but I want you guys to try it for sodium to make sure that you guys have kind of really solidified uh, what's happening with that all right good luck and I will see you guys in the zoom session